And uh, well, as I said, uh, this is the second lecture of the lecture series. The title of the series is Healing Environments. And we have tried to touch, uh, to bring uh, speakers from different, from the different programs, from the different disciplines within the school. And today is, uh, will be, we will have a landscape architect, uh, uh, Emmanuel Didier. And to present him, we will have uh, Matt Nicolette, who is uh, uh, our new assistant professor, who curated and helped us get uh, Emmanuel on board. So please, Matt. All right, thank you for coming today. Um, I would like to welcome Emmanuel to Clemson. But before we get started with the presentation, please permit me a few minutes to discuss a little bit of his background. So Emmanuel is award-winning landscape architect and founding principal of DDA Design Studio out of Fort Collins, Colorado. He's a leading figure in the public garden design and has collaborated with top botanic gardens across the nation, including Desert Botanic Garden, Denver Botanic Gardens, the Arboretum of Penn State, among other leading institutions. He also teaches graduate level studios at the University of Colorado Denver. I first became aware of Emmanuel's work through my relationship with the APGA, the American Public Garden Association, and our shared focus on cultural institutions as a center part of our practices. I was always inspired by his elegant detailing and sensitivity of place through the use of materials and attention to scale. His garden designs are some of the best in the country. They are as didactic and educational as they are beautiful and engaging. Uh, they create a sense of wonder that promote a love of the environment for all users. Um, Emmanuel holds a, master's in, uh, a Master of Architecture and a Master of Landscape Architecture from the University of Virginia, as well as a Fine Arts degree from the Ecole des Beaux-Arts, pardon the pronunciation, in his native country of France. Before starting his own practice, Emmanuel worked with child associates in Boston, Nelson Bird Waltz in Char Charlottesville, Virginia, and EDA, or now AECOM in Colorado. He brings a highly creative design approach paired with an innate ability to communicate, collaborate, and inspire people. His recent work focuses on revealing sight and ecology through artful interventions. His designs <clears throat> respect and express an authentic sense of place and identity while inviting people to connect to nature, both experientially and intellectually. So please join me in welcoming Emmanuel DDA to Clemson University. inviting me to be here today. So healing landscape, that's kind of the title we gave for this lecture within the larger uh, lecture series you have. I was just interested now, the, the time we're in, to talk about healing landscape, both as landscape that help us heal as much as we are healing landscape. And I think it's so interesting to think of those two actions actually being concurring and not in conflict, but actually supporting each other. So I'd like to talk about that today, about how we can help heal the landscape as much as we can help each other using landscape as a medium to uh, find that source of inspiration and healing again. So um, I live in Fort Collins. I'm going to try to see. I have my own practice. I also teach at the School of Architecture in Denver. And then uh, it was interesting through COVID, I don't know why this is not working, let me try this, here we go. Um, through COVID, it was interesting our firms, like we had a lot of clients and projects that were with nonprofits that were losing uh, revenue. And so we, sh we shrunk a little bit, but in some ways that challenging time through COVID for the practice was a very good one for us to reflect on what we are most pas passionate about. So it was interesting to kind of become more of a general landscape architecture firm to much more of a focused uh, mission-based practice. And we love to say that landscape is a medium uh, to explore big ideas and create, create positive change through design. And that's what I'd like to talk about today. Actually, the word place is a place I much prefer. Uh, last week, I was presenting with Lake Fledo Architects. And actually, I heard that they are coming Next week, it's funny, it's such a small world. I love working with those architects. They also care a lot about place. And what I love about that word is that it doesn't try to make a distinction between architecture or landscape architecture or also disciplines and design. It kind of brings all of this together and talks about more of a geography and, and what we can call place. And then the word making, I like that word because of my background in art and uh, the, the practice of finding through making. And it was fun this morning, we had a conversation with the students 
And they were all intrigued about the fact that I studied architecture and landscape architecture and art. And I think those uh, three fields in some ways kind of converge into uh, what I practice today. Um, and I'll talk more about this um, later. And what I like about place is kind of uh, the word landscape even is a weird word because it means landscape, the land that we look at. What I don't like about it is that it tends to put us outside that field and become, we become observers instead of realizing we live in it. When I think of place, I think of something, an environment, we're all in it, we're immersed in it and yet we're acting upon it. So it's kind of interesting also that place to me is this environment that has existed for millions of years and in some ways we come in with new ideas, new values, and the practice we do design or landscape architecture or architecture is to give form to new values. Uh, there's another, when I was at UVA, my mentor, I did a thesis there, she was uh, Beth Meyer, and I particularly love that quote about the, the relevance and the power of sight and realizing that when you come and work on a project, it's never a blank canvas, and in some ways you're not trying to push a design upon the land, but you're listening to the land first, and then you, you, you respond to it, you work with it. You, you, in some ways, your action come in synergy to the history in that place. And then, today when you were talking about environments and healing and, uh, and health, I think like living in Colorado, and you can see that hot spot uh, there, we just like are exposed to more and more understanding and science on uh, the effects of climate change. And in the West, it's a lot about fires. Here it might be a lot more about floods. Uh, this is one of the lakes around uh, Colorado and uh, in Nevada where you can see the water dropping significantly. So drought is a terrible stress onto the environment in the West. And then uh, the loss of pollinators and uh, bird habitats. And so that sense of, for you all to be that young generation coming to an architecture school and you're about to change the world, right? That's where you're in there. But you realize you come after lots of series of crises and disasters and in some ways it's how to be inspired, how to be fresh, having new ideas and be hopeful and yet be aware of all of this um, crisis happening. Um, and at the same time we had COVID and I think COVID kind of just was this incredible kind of uh, significant impactful event that reminded everybody on the power and the value in connecting people to nature. Uh, and I think it's, it was interesting, like I worked with so many botanical gardens and some of them had to close, but a lot of them instead, the community really pushed hard for keeping those institutions open because everybody was kind of really eager to step outside their house and take their children or uh, grandchildren or, and connect to nature almost as this kind of daily basis, healthy, really significant need. And so I just think that when you ask yourself what can landscape do, or what can the environment do toward kind of elevating everybody's exposure to a high quality sense of well-being and health, I think that's very powerful to ask yourself how you can transform space to achieve this. I also think it's interesting at the same time as all of those crises are unfolding, there's a lot of new publications, uh, a good friend of mine, um, well, we worked with uh, Fido Studio, who wrote Planting in a Post-Wild World, a wonderful book on reintroducing in the wild into nature in some ways. And then uh, Kelly Norris, who uh, wrote The New Naturalism, is, uh, he was working with us on uh, one of the projects I'll show you later. But what those books tell me, which is so interesting, mostly I come from France in a place of Versailles, which was all about imposing order into uh, a place and nature. And now we live in such a different time where we're eager to reintroduce the wild into our cities. And it's kind of this radical change of approach to what it means to create place. And, uh, but also what does that mean to take the cities to where they are now and how can you really successfully reintroduce wildlife and, and nature while living in it? I think it's kind of an interesting question. So I'll share some projects with you. Uh, one of the early ones we did as a collaboration with the Denver Botanical Garden uh, was a sensory garden. And it's uh, what, what happens, I don't know many of you have been to Denver at the Denver Botanical Garden. Few people, that's good. The front row, the back row is sleeping. <laughs> 
Now, yeah, if you go to Denver, it's interesting, right in the middle of the city, there is this uh, botanical garden with a lot of uh, garden rooms or programs. This was one of their programs where they, uh, they have a direct access for people with uh, special needs. So they have a lot of hospitals and institutions, and what they do is that inst some of those hospitals are fairly urban institutions, and they don't have access to land to do a healing garden, for example. So they are doing a collaboration with the Denver Botanical Garden where they take people on tours or program for two or three hours. And uh, the space that they had available was this kind of sunken room right against a big concrete wall and it's very hot space. And the question was, how do you turn this place, urban, very urban concrete space, into a, a comfortable place for people uh, to come connect to nature? So here is where we are in Denver, <clears throat> moving in as part of the Denver Botanical Garden. And here is a photo of a after, and you can see at the, on the right side there, there's a, a historical building, very large concrete with cells facing this way, so it builds up heat all throughout the day. And then most people enter this way, and so in some ways this room felt very uncomfortable at first. It's almost like going to the zoo where you're looking down onto people. So if you can imagine, if you already come and you feel distressed and you come to kind of calm down and connect to nature and you feel observed, that's one of the conditions that is extremely uncomfortable. Uh, and so the, the question is how to create this sense of secluded space that is very uh, easy access. So this is a path that they come through. So this is all universal accessible. And what, talking to some of the educators and people that were gonna do the program, they couldn't over pack the space because to move some of those children, they come and they have uh, severe disabilities where they can't move at all. And they're in those wheelchairs that are electrics and they, they need a fairly large amount of space to be able to move around and gather. And so when we did it, we looked at the climate of the room and realizing that having a large shade structure against this wall, here is a big wall, and really kind of intensify the planting on all edges to try to take the scale down and create that sense of immersive uh, expanse, as well as flexibility where you could choose, depending on the time of the year in Colorado, like in March, you could very really have a good time being in full sun and you may really appreciate the full sun, but in July, you do not want the full sun. And so be able to choose and, and evolve the place depending on the time of the year. And then a lot of the scents, like scent, a visual taste and tout, touch, those were all um, distributed throughout. And so I'll talk about that, but once, there's a lot of research being done, and actually when I went out to VA, one of the hospitals was doing a lot of um, testing and research. It's interesting that it looks like you have a great program here with a lot of people doing research and evaluating the post-construction and really realizing whether things are effective or not. But one thing that was being discovered at the time was that if you can really allow people to disconnect from the source of their stress and be immersed into something that creates back that sense of positive and positive change by touching things, smelling them, how do you allow them to kind of move their mind to a new place and recenter themselves? Uh, there's a, a lot of powerful value in that. It kind of helps lower blood pressure. It kind of uh, helps with attention. Um, and so part of this exercise was to isolate distinct um, sensory experiences. What you don't want to do anyway is put all of the fragrance in one corner. Uh, like it, it would be like asking someone to eat a meal and have Asian and French and uh, something else all in one plate, and then you can't even tell what you're eating, which is kind of what Thanksgiving is like, but <laughs> I love Thanksgiving. <laughs> Usually it's really good if you want people to be able to connect you can't have it all. It's like listening to a symphonic orchestra and everybody was playing the most like high level note at the same time that would not take you anywhere. You want to be able to subtract some senses in order to emphasize some other senses. In some ways you can't have light if you don't have dark, you can't have dark if you don't have light. And it works the same way. You can't appreciate something really refined in terms of taste or smell if something is really loud next to you and really bright. And so you try to think about how you can really carefully think about the journey and how you move people through and expose them to distinct senses as they go. Here is what we, when we were doing a model, we 
we use uh, 3D software to try to account for scale. It's a lot about scale. I think immersing people into nature is all about how you bring that urban scale down to something much more uh, at the scale of the body. And so looking carefully at the heights of some of those textures and plants, the shade, and we came up with this table that you can move and it can um, be raised or lowered. So depending on if you're coming with a walker, you need plants, maybe this is maybe actually a good height. So what we did, we, we worked with those groups, we took measurements and we tested the idea, is it best to have this or to have this? And realizing that if you're in a wheelchair and if you want to do some gardenings for even just half an hour, you can't ask that person to have their arm way up for too long. You, can't, you don't feel good that way. So you want to be able to carefully think about what is the right height and then what you realize, diversity is good. It, you can't even start to think that you can have one dimension hitting all of the needs at once. So this is that room built and you can see that large wall and this was just planted, so since then it really grew up and some of the vines are gonna develop. We ended up putting a shade fabric for a few years until those vines come in. And then when doing the floor, we use um, very unique pavers that almost have no seam. I don't know if you've been on a tatami, but what I love about a tatami, when you walk on a tatami, there's a sense of something very quiet and you come in and there's no bumps and you kind of flow onto it. And in some ways I thought, for those people, you go from the city with all of the cracked concrete and all that. In Colorado, we have a lot of expandable clay, so the, the floor is always moving. So I wanted something that when you come in, you almost feel like there's a sense of quiet space and you can float right in and it's seamless and very kind of, it feels different. And also something that over time, if it starts cracking, you can always reset that floor into something special. And when we did the composition, I'll go back a few slides, uh, we played with the sense that I wanted the dark bands around the perimeter so that it glows in the middle, and I also wanted the dark on the edges so that plants, in contrast to that dark gray, seem even more lush and alive and bright green. So it's, you can see the, it's very subtle, but it kind of works at almost lifting the center of the room and then it lifts the plants by contrast to the dark. So what I'm saying is that someone asked me actually, what did I learn in art that echoes what I do today? I think the biggest thing was realizing that color matters. And when we teach landscape architecture, even in my school, nobody talked about color. It was kind of strange because at the end of the day, when you're choosing material and putting a plant together, when you build it, you'd better just not hope for the best and just gamble and think, oh, that brick is great and then that stone is great and then this is great and then you put them together and you really don't like it. So I think realizing that when you're doing plans and so forth, having samples and work and realizing everything has a color, everything has a texture and everything exists together and so make sure you kind of tie things together. So I think when you do a sensory space, in my mind, it's kind of what I was saying, where you want to subtract certain things in order to value other things. And it's all about those relationships. The, the warmth of the wood versus other elements. Why it matters, I think what's powerful is how, the way that space with those educators is able to kind of take them away from their daily stress and routines to suddenly a fairly magical space where community comes together. They exchange stories. I think what's powerful is even um, a lot of people who have dementia and uh, if you can bring them back to something where they can connect to their childhood and tell stories of that, that creates this sense of shared uh, moment and shared community. This was a portion of the garden that was kind of connecting to uh, celebrating some of the old uh, healing plants uh, used throughout the world. And this is just another series of vignettes that we use a lot to talk about the power of the plants in kind of allowing people to connect to that moment, whether you're very young or much older, and our color, touch, smell, sound, they all are fairly magical in kind of allowing people to bridge and connect to um, nature. Can you hear me okay? Yeah, good. So another project we just recently did was at the Denver Art Museum. They were doing this gigantic project of renovating the whole building and they realized 
outdoor. This is like a second floor kind of concrete platform. Uh, they have a big indoor space, which is actually one of, uh, for an art museum, one of the largest education programs in the US. And they, they use art as a kind of healing sensory kind of factor, but they realized they really wanted uh, to also incorporate the element of uh, a natural element as part of their program. So here we are in Denver, and zooming in, and you can see the, the Ponty building right there, and then the Liebenskin building addition later. And what's interesting, the, the, how many of you have seen that, but the Ponty building as an art museum looks like a castle. I thought that was very weird coming from France, and when I saw the museum, I said, why would you put art in the castle? Like, this is like, and so, it's kind of interesting because it's kind of this very unfolded skin with tiles on it, which kind of brings the human hand on it. And you have all those apertures, and it's, some of them almost look like gems, and to me it's almost like partly a joke that makes me uncomfortable, as if the jewels are inside and you're outside. And uh, politically, I'd have, I thought that was very strange. And here is the image of the castle, and you can see how much it really looks like it, like the tower there, and you have those micro little defensive systems, and it's kind of, right? But anyway, so that's how they did the, um, and in France, where I come from, when you have a castle, what's interesting, they used to grow food right outside of it. So actually, the bottom of the castle used to be a much more humble place where people lived and, and gardened and made food. And I thought, wow, this is interesting, because the Denver Art Museum is this place that really cleared out all of the landscape. There's no living system. That that plaza was a dead pan of concrete against a uh, concrete wall, very hot and nothing alive. Like you don't even find a bee. Maybe you could find a dead moth. That was the best living thing you could find. And I thought it's kind of a true, unique opportunity to kind of bring back life. In some ways, it's a project about how can we bring the, long, the displaced landscape into this project and uh, use it as part of the potting, hands-on, take-home, education, bouquet pruning, as really this source of inspiration. So there's art, reflection, sensory. Those were early sketches when we started a project, I always start to think, and I was thinking, well, the, the first thing that has to come in is water, because that's what brings life, and now there is no water, and then we need soils. And I was thinking, well, maybe we could do it as a Temporary intervention, we would bring giant bags, we puncture holes in it, and we could let plants burst. Almost this really expression. There was an art movement in Italy called Arte Povera, and they were doing those installation with Connellis and all this, where they would fill up the gallery with soil and watch the walls start warping and smell. You have a t-shirt with mushroom, it's perfect. You could go see the <laughs> Connellis show. <laughs> and that was, we did, we always do models as well. So I sketch a lot to develop an idea right away. And then models are great because they allow you to test an idea at true scale, and you can move things around. And we will bring that model in the room with all of the educators and the program and the art director. And it was fun because everybody was so excited. Like, you could all be designing together, and it was very helpful. So you could move those bags of soils and things around. And then they got so excited about this project, they said, well, actually, Let's not make it so temporary. At first, it was going to be lasting three years, and I thought, OK, the bags of soil will be perfect. They actually said, well, let's make it more permanent than that. We're really going to use this space. So we came up with the same idea, but the idea of crates, the idea that you take a piece of landscape from somewhere, and what if you could bring it back? And talk about what you lost when you build a building, what you've lost when it's great. You have the, the jewels inside, the art is inside, everything is very protected, but there's no more life in there. How do we bring life at the base of, of the building? So that was that notion of those imported, very carefully crafted volumes that when you come out through this door, it, right away, you're kind of exposed to that corner and plants, and you have to walk around and create some subspaces. The idea was to break down the room with only a few moves that yet creates a lot of different scales and use where you can find yourself between two fragments of landscape versus a gathering, and that's what will allow them to have art programs. You could do watercolor, you could do drawings and photography and so forth. So we like it to call the source, where you come almost like the way Monet you know, do his garden in order to kind of do art from it. It was kind of this idea of like, let's 
let's really create this place that is so rich and packed with plants that you come out and it doesn't matter which season, you'll find something that really inspires that next idea and flow. Um, so plants, water, soil. So we start with the soil, that's what the crates are for. Then we put water and instead of a fancy water feature, it was this, um, the idea of a very temporary rail. It's just a piece of steel, like a container that every morning as a practice, you water plants, you're gonna fill up the trough with fresh water and then throughout the day will just evaporate. And then the next morning you come back and you refill it. It's almost this daily routine, something very simple. You don't have to filter, you don't have to do anything to it. So those were the renderings. When we did the model, I was really careful about the corners, you don't bump your knee there, you expose the fact that it's fabricated in a crate and then how many panels so that you get the right height. And this one had four boards, there's one recessed. There's one back there that's higher and then there's this um, wall that exposes it even higher. So you have three heights. It was almost like the earth with water, waters and then sky with those grasses. So here is being installed. So actually, it was interesting. It was um, I had this huge studio before in a barn, and uh, COVID hit, and everybody was at home, and I had this whole space, and we were doing this project, and someone else was going to build it, and then we were losing projects because a lot of clients were losing revenue. I said, well, I'm going to build it with I had two good friends, a carpenter and a metal worker. So we push all the desks aside, and actually for three months we just built this crates and they were, this one was built in two pieces and it was brought onto a truck and then they had a huge crane and they brought the crate, then we brought the, the soil in huge bags, filled up and then we worked with the Denver Botanical Garden horticulture to kind of infill all of those beds. So it was very interesting where it was one of the only projects where I actually put a hand into the fabric. I was the one staining all the wood. And I remember it was a July and there was huge wildfires outside Fort Collins and the sky was orange and ashes were falling down. It was this very like dark moment. <laughs> it was truly a healing garden for me. <laughs> this is a, a great friend with a horticulture and was installing the place. And what I love about it is that they had done that really nicely where they invited a few key members, people from the art programs, as well as the horticulture, and we were there. It was like through the end of COVID and we were all, I mean, COVID is still happening, I shouldn't say the end of COVID, but it was a time when you couldn't be in an office and we were all there together building this garden together. And here is that beam of water and the idea was to play with, you see that window? The fact that a window in a museum is kind of very culturally uh, crafted so that you let a little bit of light, it gives you that little glimpse of the distant landscape. And I thought it'd be fun to, at the base of the building, bring back life and water, but it's almost one of those windows that allows sky to come down into this project and kind of celebrate that distant view and life coming back. So a lot of the plants that you see there are plants from the steppe biome. We had done a few years ago um, another living garden as a center for research on the steppe biome. So Denver is in the steppe region, which is kind of not just grassland. It's like the, the land got lifted up and created this uh, very shrub layer and grass mix. Uh, and you find that biome in four regions in the world. There is Patagonia, South Africa, and then Mongolia and Denver is in it too. So a lot of those plants are from that displaced landscape. And it's really wonderful to open it and then everybody came and because of the height, people want to touch the plants. What's interesting when we walk, you know, in the world like, and I'll talk about when we talk about pollinators because sometimes the tiny things are around that ground. I mean, kids will crawl, I'll crawl and go and look at things, but most people don't want to crawl down and put their head into the soil and plants. But if you lift up the plant, it becomes much more at the hand level and you start to observing some things and touch them and smell them in a way that you wouldn't if you were in normal um, space. So I'll talk next about, on that question of healing and, and sensory and the values in connecting people to nature. <clears throat> we did some projects, this is at Penn State, 
children's garden. It was, they have a big arboretum and they wanted to do a small garden intervention that would allow kids to reconnect to the natural environment. Like there was a book that had came out, uh, Last Child in the Woods by uh, Richard Louvre, that mentioned that most kids today, they're all on their iPad, they're all on their phones and different things, and they, the last thing they do is connect to nature. And he kind of highlighted all of the deficits that come with uh, uh, being disconnected from nature. He also wrote Nature, uh, Vitamin N. I don't know if you wrote that. Last Child in the Woods, very powerful writing. And what's interesting with this is that a lot of botanical gardens that used to be almost these places that most people feel like, well, that's like the Latin world. Like in a botanical garden, I'm just gonna talk, like, it's like very eyebrow, kind of scary. Why would I go there? Everything is written in Latin. When actually, what botanical garden realizes is that they could really be quite inspiring to some of the younger generation and, and, and why nature matters. So they started creating around the nation, you see there's a trend in the last 10, 12 years about those uh, children and family gardens. This is not even one acre. But the goal was this, out. I like to talk about out and realizing that children, they don't read signs. So if you want them to learn about nature, they're not gonna do it by opening a book. They're gonna read it by using their body and playing through the space and go over, under, and through and climb things and go through things, and that's how they're gonna create experiences and memories that are gonna be uh, everlasting. And also, realizing that you don't learn by reading the sign, you're learning by, I think you, step one is to create the question. If you create a garden, an environment that is so inspiring and rich and something, you see something, you're like, why is this this way? And I think by creating the question, you're kind of starting the education. The other thing I wanted to do is make sure that those spaces are inclusive to all. Like you realize the kids that go to a children's garden, they are not driving themselves, not yet. One day with those self-driven cars, maybe kids can go on there. But right now it's either the caregivers, the grandpas, the parents that are taking them. So if you want a successful children's garden, you need to make it good for everybody. Because those caregivers, they, if they don't have a great time, they'll leave right away or they won't come back. And so if you want to make it great for the grandpa or the grandma or the caregiver, you're also making it great for the kids because they can safely go and play. The other thing that you realize if you look at a lot of children's garden, some of them are enclosed and feel like safe uh, for kids. And that's, those are the ones I tend to favor because if you don't enclose the space and parents don't trust the garden, they won't let them run on their own. If you, don't learn, if you don't let the kids run on their own into a space, they don't have the chance to do it at their speed with their interest. Some kids, one day, they'll do 15 times, 50 times, 60 times the same thing over and over because they discovered something and they realize they can do it and they love it and that's all they want to do. Most parents don't have the patience. What they want to do is just take a quick picture, put it on Instagram, and then move on. And you realize that doesn't give enough time for the children to really connect to the place. So here we are in Pennsylvania. How many of you have been in Pennsylvania? It's a little closer to home. Oh yeah, more, yeah, more. <laughs> the Appalachian, right? You could almost drive up. What's interesting is this amazing topography. And in State College is right in the center. Also similar history, so because it was an ag school that became a lot more. And like Clemson, I realized this morning I was walking around campus and realized it was an ag school when it started. And now a lot more to it. But when I, when I started that project at Penn State, I didn't know what that garden was going to be about. I had no idea. I just wanted, I knew it was going to be all about taking kids over, under, and through, and exposing them to nature, connecting, making sure they can fall in love with the natural environment. What I realized is flying over, when they realized I had never seen a river going against mountains. I mean, how many of you went to school and learned that when it rains, the water falls down a slope, goes down in the valley, follows the valley, and then one day either goes to the Mississippi River or the Atlantic Ocean or whatever, right? But did you know that mount rivers could go against mountains? So that was, that was a question I asked. It's kind of like a children's garden where like, what's going on there? Like, why, why, how did that happen? So it was wonderful because one thing that I strongly care about is when I, whenever I do a project, I love to think that a project has a story. If it doesn't have a story, it's not a project yet. 
what I love about stories is that we all own the story. So when we do a project, it's kind of the whole team and the client and everybody owns the story. It's not about me, it's not about you, it's not whether I like this or I like this. At the end of the day, if we have a strong story, you make all of your decisions around the story. Is this good for the story or is it not helping the story? And in this case, that becomes a story, the geology, geomorphology, realizing that Pennsylvania is a dynamic terrain. It's always moving and it's been changing for millions of years and continues to change. And it explains everything about the economics in Pennsylvania, where you have agriculture, where you have forest. It's all dictated by the geology. And that's really amazing. And for kids to go into a garden and learn that without reading a sign was kind of the, the mission of this garden in some ways. And the way we organized it, it was just a flat field at first. We had to create that topography. And we wanted to celebrate those ridges and valleys and the story of water finding its way through the cracks. I forget this is not working. Uh, so what was interesting, when the director of the botanical garden realized we were going to do something on geology, he wanted this to be really grounded in science. And that, I think, is another key aspect of any given project, is to always go back to the science and the research and not just kind of make a kind of story, but really try to find what's authentic about this place. We had this amazing professor. His name was Duff Gold of all names as a professor of um, geomorphology. That was fantastic. And he, told us a lot about what happened and why you have a cave in the limestone and not the sandstone and the way it erodes away and why you have sinkholes. And we thought, wow, we should do a garden with a sinkhole in it. So I want to show you that. So when you enter, and you may not get the story, but the story here is the way what used to be a mountain is now a valley. And that's the story. So when you come in, you realize that the, the top of a mountain or a ridge around Pennsylvania is actually kind of like a cupcake almost, like this. And then it goes down. And um, what happens is millions of years ago, the African plate pushed against the American plate, Africa, and it created those ripples. So the stone plates got pushed and made, I'm not going to draw a diagram, but uh, it created those waves. The top of the waves, what used to be a mountain, was all cracked because of being pushed from under. So over millions of years, it just eroded away. But the bottom was so compressed because it had been pushed, very hard material, so that doesn't erode, and that stays a mountain. So it's interesting that today, when you walk through that landscape, what, when you walk in a valley, you actually walk in what was a mountain. I just thought, wow, that's pretty fantastic, the fact that things can be reversed. We always think of the landscape as being it. And I think for everybody to realize that landscape is alive. It's, it's always flowing, it's always changing. Change is not a new thing. And learning how to accept that and live with it, I think it can be very powerful. So when you move in, you go through a crack, you discover the valley. The valley is where you grow things. It's scaled one to one. You have the raised bed, you do a lot of hands-on activities, you find worms. You have a cloche because of the, when the winter comes over there, it kind of helps extend the season. You can uh, save some old fossils or you can save some um, bones and you can save, it's kind of like this attic, this magic attic and magic box where you can have a lot of things and build bird houses. But it's also a great place to tell stories and do group activities where you can go and do uh, fetch all of the pine cones you can find or all of the acorns you can find and you come back and you can learn and tell stories. And then when you move through, you find this, this lifted landform that relates to what's below, and you can find this opening, and you go through the landscape that way, and, and you rub against plants, and you have the fragrance, and the smell, and the shade, and the contrast of being exposed and versus under the trees. And you come and find those fractured places that lead you into discovering the place. When when doing this, you can see the scale of this child through this crack. It was done so like parents could not go through. I wanted a place where you find the water and you follow it, you can walk in it, and you go through that crack. It's only this wide. So kids can go in, but the parents have to go through a different route. So the whole garden is designed so you lose your parents, pretty much. <laughs> and they pay me for that. <laughs> but as you go, you discover a cave 
if you look up, that's a sinkhole, and you learn this cleft being underground, and water drips constantly and makes that sound, and this is where the water begins. So you realize that water begins there, goes through the crack, it becomes a little stream, and you follow it. And so the garden is full of stories, and then you, it's almost like going from the mineral story and the rock and the stone and the underground, and then you learn about woodland, and this is like this giant tree that died, and you can come in and out, and then here is that cloche. This is a unique uh, native caterpillar that only feeds on spice bush. What well, was fun, we had planted all those spice bush around it, which you find in a native forest in, over there. And the day of the opening, I won't kill, there was a little uh, caterpillar, a real one, that came and nobody put it there. It was just there. <laughs> it was so much fun that we did this giant sculpture of the caterpillar. And the kids love this caterpillar. We have to repaint it every six months because it just rub it all the time. I'm gonna show you another botanical garden that also wanted to do a children's garden. This one is not built yet. This was done actually in collaboration with Lake Fredo Architects, and it's in Arizona. And I just wanted to show you how, what it's like to design for an authentic story in Pennsylvania versus what would that look like to do a children's garden in Arizona? A different climate, as you know it. Here we are next to the Papago Buttes and the grid of uh, Phoenix at the Desert Botanical Garden. And what they wanted to do, they have this amazing existing series of gardens. How many of you have been to Phoenix? Uh, there's a, yeah. You gotta go, it's really fantastic. It's, it's really like, uh, this, model, this morning we were looking at one of the students' model and it, she had used um, little colorful little pieces, almost like uh, as if you were swimming underwater and seeing all of this uh, coral reef. And actually, when you go into a desert garden, I think you almost feel like you're a fish in the, like some of the cactus are incredible in their shapes. Uh, it's another world. Anyhow, it's a very beautiful yet very precious garden. So what happens is that kids know that they can't really get off the path. It's very beautiful, very special, but very adult oriented. So they, the whole community is getting together and wanting to do this uh, center where a place for kids and families to play and be a lot more hands-on. In terms of site, we're right there, and you can see how it's kind of connected to two different landforms and two different geological formations. There's this one versus this one. This one is a fantastic kind of landform eroded by wind. It creates these very rounded shapes. It's pretty uh, spectacular. And then in terms of vegetation, this is a kind of vegetation, so it's not all cactus. As you can see, there's a lot of diversity, actually and a lot of fun things to play with. So when we did the garden, it's about three and a half acres with an entry there, and here it is. The main question again was, what is this all about? And uh, there's a great little book in uh, saying that the arroyo, that's a local name for that little swell, which is most of the time dry, but it's called the highway of the desert, like that's where the creatures tend to go up and down through the desert, they move through that dry bed which tends to be sandy and gravel. And because it's protected, you, you have shade and you're not as exposed, otherwise you're gonna get caught by something. And what we did, the first move was working with the architects, instead of putting the education building in the center, we moved it to the side. And that was a very conscious move, working with Lake Fledo to kind of create a frame and really embed and celebrate some of the native landscape. Here is what it looks like on site, and you can see they can't grow big trees like, I forget sometimes living in Colorado, I come back, I love when I was walking this morning, you see oak trees are so huge here, you can't grow an oak tree that size, and definitely not over there. Oh. So trees, they look like real mature trees when they're 20 feet tall, and so it's very different, the texture is much lower, and it's very easy to hide something because if you just have a few shrub and scrub, you can hide, and then suddenly you can reveal views. So it's a very interesting place to play with. And here is that building off to the side with the idea of having classrooms and an outdoor space, and an outdoor amphitheater, a space where you could all move freely and find shade, find water, classrooms to learn things, come in and out. You can see how this is conceived as one space and you just put glass in the middle, but this is one room, indoor and outdoor. Here is some of the views of those landforms. You can see on one hand you have this one 
and then the other one. This is always native stone, native plants, places to tell stories, that amphitheater that leads you to discover that central play of the uh, arroyo. Here is kind of a rendering of what we want it to look like, totally non-pristine, as messy as it gets. Lots of scales of rocks and things to discover and tilt over and discover, crawl under those branches and go discover the next spaces. It's also a place that when it does rain or after a rain, you would find traces of water. And it's a great story to talk about roots because usually in Arroyo you have a lot of erosion, so it's a great place for kids to realize how root system grow in that region and that the, the world, when you see a tree, you only see half of it, half of it is below. Learning the stories about cactus and how they serve so many purposes in the desert as habitats while they are alive for some birds and owls and so forth. And then once they fall down for lizards and all this, so as a kid, we wanted to create those giant folded cactus trees where you can crawl in it. Water play is huge because it's so hot, so creating this wet plaza and working, the idea of working with an artist and doing those um, interpretive sculptures of cactus that uh, serve as reserve for water, that percolates water, evaporates water, and cools down, and you can play with a little bit of water in the mud where you could turn on the water and turn it off and you don't have to have water all the time. And then the last bit was to play with, you know, people in Japan talk a lot about borrowed landscape, so we played that game here where we have the existing hill behind and we wanted to create this full cave as a place to uh, find a lot of shade and, and play with sounds and light. So this would be almost a garden of light and sounds. And you can go up and watch the moon. There's something in the desert when it's really hot, you actually stay inside in the day, but at the evening is where you can go out, it's much cooler, so the temperature drops radically very fast, 20 degrees in one hour almost. And as soon as the sun comes down, you could gather there and watch the moon rise over the desert, which is incredible, and this could become a great storytelling circle. And then we played with the stone so that you could hide and conceal the city lights and really reveal the sky above. So I wanted to share that story because in some ways, uh, when we did that project, we had Richard Louvre, and you should search him, but um, he came and presented with us of why we're doing those landscapes and why does it matter in terms of uh, health and well-being. And he's the one who wrote that uh, book that I was telling you about um, Last Child in the Woods. And he says, the future will belong to the nature smart, those individuals, families, businesses, and political leaders who develop a deeper understanding of the transformative power of the natural world and who balance the virtual with the real. The more high-tech we become, the more nature we need. And I thought it was just a beautiful, inspiring quote in terms of how do we want to manage our cities? I think it's awesome to push technology, to push new forms of architecture, because we have new values, we have new ways of living, but how we also need to balance this with intensified moments of nature and nature connection. And I thought that was a beautiful question he asked. He said, why don't we design cities the same way we design children's garden? Why is it that when you step outside in a city, it's not equally immersive, amazing, where all your senses are engaged, where you hide and reveal, where it feels like you're discovering something. You're going to your meeting, but on the way you discover a leaf or a leaf pattern you've never seen before. How enchanting would that be? And I thought that was a beautiful question, and that question, we, he had it, and it's been inhabiting my work since then. So um, when we did some of those projects, that's kind of what's behind it but I wanted to share with you a couple more projects that kind of relate to that question of what it would mean as well, how do you do it to bring that wild back in the city? It's not an obvious, it's not like you just peel off the asphalt and put some seeds and something happens. You have to do more than that. Um, so there's a project I want to tell you about in Greater Des Moines, in Des Moines, and there's a Greater Des Moines Botanical Garden, sorry, right by the river. It's located there. How many of you have been? Yeah! <laughs> Actually, great city. I didn't think much of it. And then there's great architecture in it, a beautiful museum done by three key designers that kind of create the art museum as a composite of three voices. I think it's quite beautiful. And like many cities in the US, you know, kind of at the convergence of two rivers. And even in Europe, it's a lot of cities. The city where I was born was built by the Romans. 
and it was located where two rivers were meeting. It's just an essential thing because that's where there is water and that's where there is wildlife, that's where there is life. Uh, that's how you can sustain a city. But like many American cities, when they are developing, they clear the heck out of it. Like the river doesn't have any single living thing along its bank. It's been mowed and mowed. It's very hard. Now finally you see a few trees. It was just uh, some of the effects of the Army Corps of engineers wanting to calculate flows and flooding and so forth and really clearing the, any wildlife along it. And yet there is this botanical garden there located in the river. And what's interesting when you zoom in, this is the existing extents of the garden right by the river, but very formal, very cultural, quite beautiful, but very kind of held back. And there's a wall between the garden and uh, the river. And so we came to this project and I was thinking, this is interesting, this, God, this place is right at the base of a very steep slope. Why is there a slope there? What's happening? So we did some research and realized that this land is actually at the southern tip of an ancient like glacier deposit. So it's interesting, there was a glacier that came all the way down there. That's the southern tip of it. And when they move, they deposit, you can see all that like that got pushed and dropped. And then the glacier melts. And when it melts, that water has to go somewhere. So it creates a river. And then later when it keeps raining and so forth, that becomes even a greater river. But that place, if you think about it, is that the friction of that old deposit and then the river carving its way against or through it. And I thought that was so fascinating to understand that as a botanical garden, there's a whole dimension that was not expressed there at all. It was much more of that, the conservatory and some of those formal alleys and garden. Like in some ways when I see an alley now, it's like this borrowed landscape from somewhere else. What is the relevance of an alley now? Can anybody give me an answer? Why do we still do an alley? An alley was done where someone wants to express their identity out to the outside world. So they have this big fancy villa. And at the time, there was no climate change. So you can put 50 trees of the same species and it worked. None of them would die. You'd, no missing tooth, right? But now through storm and climate change, you can't even do an alley. Otherwise, you, you know you're going to lose at least two trees. And what does an alley look like if you start to miss two teeth here, two teeth there? It looks like an old thing. It doesn't look like a living system. And so an alley now in the botanical garden to me is kind of a crime. Uh, it's, yeah, there's also something powerful about an alley, but you could do it differently. And I think we just have to change the way we think landscape. It can't just be a repeat of some old cultural system that have nothing to do. We don't, I mean, yeah, some countries still have kings and queens. And I know that we, we are recently reminded of that. But in many ways, your values, the way you're aspiring today, the way you can all share this space in a democratic way, I just think that we are transforming the way we think landscape. And so when I arrived there, I just thought, there's such a powerful topography and history behind the site. And instead of a controlled landscape, what if instead we could really amp up that sense of diversity? What if we could really those are the kind of sketches I do when I'm on the plane, like coming back from a meeting. There's nothing to do on the plane but having a little drink and a draw, right? So you open the sketchbook and you can reflect on where you were and thinking, why wow, it would be kind of fun to take people through a flood plane and contrast that to being upland and, and going through a grove and, and then changing habitats. And then by exposing all of those, you kind of really enchant people about the power of their region and nature. So here is that zone I'm going to talk about. And when you cut a section through it, you can go through an amphitheater, a swale, contrast it to a dry meadow, we're going to call it, and then go all the way down to the river being right there. So instead of a mowed edge with no habitat and then a flatland, and then you can really contrast and play and expose all of those gradations of ecology along the way and then within the programs for people. So the idea of transect to me is always very inspiring. You don't have to solve the whole plan right away. Instead, what if you looked at it in terms of sections, in terms of terrain, and it expands. So one garden we just did was a dry meadow garden. And it's a type of landscape that is not really celebrated much. But in Iowa, like around Des Moines, you have uh, those sand hills collected like, after this erosion and what happened with the, the um, 
the ice pushing on that land is that there was uh, a lot of wind erosion as well that came and created those uh, very unique topographies of sand hills that have a unique ecology on it with certain types of plants that support certain pollinators. And it was very interesting to do a, so that's what we did, we did a garden just about that kind of ecology. And I love, you see those gradations of colors, very subtle. So I was doing this drawing, kind of saying, well, this garden is not about a contained, specific, what if it goes from water to gradations of different ecotones and different palettes together. So then the horticultural staff, we looked at it and the created a berm and he was doing this beautiful drawing as a, as a planting plan. And here he is, like we, they had put some plugs and then seeding, so it's a mix of creating the right soils and topography and uh, controlling the nutrients so you can't compete against weeds and then do a mix for the installation. And then we had an artist actually from Spain, from Bilbao, and he does a, a novella and he does those huge cotton sculptures across the world and that's a huge leaf in a memorial of the founders of that garden. And then we, we had fun just simply the, the basics of landscape. We create a berm, so we create a swale. And those two play off of another, one another as two ecologies. How are we doing on time? Good? Okay. Five, ten minutes? Yeah? So that's the last project. Um, and the idea of, uh, when I think of cities now, and, and if you have to reintroduce diversity, so this project is that also at the Arboretum at Penn State, it was done with the Center for Research on Pollination. And those people have done years and years of research and lecture all over the world on what it means to have a very healthy, diverse, functioning habitat for pollinators and birds. And what they wanted to do was turn three and a half acres of pasture land, monoculture, flatland, into the most vibrant, healthy, ecosystem you could think of as a way of really continuing their research, but also as a place to tell stories about that and also creating routes throughout that maybe on your way to school, on your way to work, you could pass through and learn about those habitats. So it's really a, a space that is open to all, all time of the day, at night, and you can go through it. Uh, so this was also done with Lake Fledo Architects for the um, Birdhouse, uh, and then also with Fido Studio. I don't know if many of you know they work beautiful. Uh, they're out of uh, north of Washington, D.C. So here is the context. Here's where we are. And I want to talk about that, too, because I think for you all, it's one thing to think of architecture and landscape as art. But you realize you really have to bridge it with science. And the more you can balance those two brains, science and research, with art and intuition, I think the more powerful it gets and the more relevant it gets to everybody. So those are just two slides to, uh, when we met for that project, I had about 10 people doing, they have their PhDs in research on pollination, they had huge thesis, and I asked them to convey to me the essence of their research and what we should know so that we can do a successful uh, pollinator and bird garden. And we extracted some of those design principles, and here is, this was a children's garden I showed you, and this is the rest of the arboretum that is very established. And this is the extent of the site just after construction. And we'll talk more about this disc. I wanna tell you, like, when you arrive in the garden, you kind of arrive through this, and you come upon this giant disc, which is roughly 90 feet diameter on the inside, and then a series of berms and hills. So this is a plan, and what we tried to do is you know, so many kids, they go to school, they learn that bees are dying, but they don't know what to do about it. There's almost this elevated sense of stress and level of alarm about, hey, our environment is dying, what should we do? But I don't think that we're giving them the tools to be inspired and on what to do. And so in some ways, one of the things about this garden was to give people who just have few parts, what could they do? If you have a backyard or a front yard, what can you do? Versus if you have a bigger space, in bigger space, if you're a campus, what can you do? If you're kind of a region or parks or versus a larger system, what can you do? So we tried to take that question at multiple scales. And the way to do it was really to manipulate the ground plane, to go from a very one type of condition to as many conditions as we create. So we realized the goal of that tilted disk was to, first of all, it was a statement. It was saying, 
where are we doing with polyhedras across the world? And, and creating this tilted disk for me was almost like the Earth unbalanced. There was this non-balanced condition. Something is about to happen and flip and, uh, and expands that. I also wanted to make sure that when you arrive, you feel comfortable entering a pollinator garden. So many people, when we ask them, they say, oh, it's great to do something pollinators, but are you gonna have bees there? Am I gonna get stung? So they want you to do something but pollinators, but over there, and then can you give me a garden here? They don't wanna be mixed with it. So in some ways, if you think about that, you wanna build that sense of trust and the feeling that it's gonna be okay. And so what I thought is that if you arrive on the garden, almost looking at it from above, it's almost like looking at the world in Google Earth. You're all using Google Earth. When you look at Google Earth, there's no smell to it. It feels very safe. You don't get stung. So you feel like, hey, I can go in there, and you can start zooming in, right? And as you walk around, you slowly find yourself immersed into this environment. And you can see how sculpting the ground plane allowed us to suddenly go from one monoculture to all of those diversities of different um, conditions. And here is the overall place. This was just after a few months of establishment of the plants. So a lot of the woodland needs to develop. Here's that disc I was showing you. You enter from over there. And those are the back ridges we created with that birdhouse. What I wanted to do was flip that relationship, feel like you're entering a garden where it's about pollinators within the world of people, to suddenly flipping it where you feel like you're a person entering the world of pollinators. And by doing that disk, you go from feeling like you arrive from above to slowly as you move around, you may even be on your cell phone and you don't notice you're talking to your mother or something, and then you find yourself where you can enter the plaza and you find yourself almost eye to eye with pollinators. That's a very different set of relationships. I feel like sometimes playing with those sets of relationships in a very intentional way can really be what can be inspiring or revealing to people. If our role, like some people say, what art does is to reveal. I think uh, as an architect, as a landscape architect, that's one of the powers you have is to reveal things and to create new sets of relationships. And the same way, I show that slide because as a landscape architect, I want to talk about in some ways the ground plane, the topography, but also the soils, the way you assemble soils is the amateur, is your architecture. And that's where all of the living systems will develop on it. So if you want to create a lot of diversity, what you realize, you can't just have one type of soil. What we think is dirt, it's not dirt, it's soils, and with a nest at the end, and realizing that to increase all types of habitats and diversity, you have a lot of opportunity along a section to create a lot of different conditions, and that's what will allow a lot of more diversity in terms of what you can grow there. Some plants want well-draining soil. Some plants will want very saturated soil. Some plants want slow of shade. Some plants want full sun. And so to create that diversity and extensive habitat quality within cities, you realize that I love Richard Zouf's question because in many ways, we'll have to start sculpting those areas between driving lanes and things so that we can create those immersive experiences with a lot of different conditions. Within it, I wanted to create what I call the beehive or bee house where you can go and you share a moment with actual living bees. This was designed and intended to kind of shield from the direct sunlight. And then you can find the bird house and it's really a contemplative place where you can go sit, you have chairs, you're on campus. A lot of students go there, they bring their laptops and they do work while watching birds and dragonflies uh, interact with this environment. This is after one year of growth. But you can also just, what I love about parks and gardens, they are kind of art forms, but it's not in a gallery that is removed from the world we live in. What I love about landscape, it's outside, and you may just walk through it with your dog. You may just take a stroll with your young ones. And it's a, really a place to learn, discover where pollinators live, it could be a way after, of uh, reducing stress after work, or you, maybe you're going to work. But if you think of uh, art inserted into everybody's life on a day-to-day -day basis, this is maybe just a posing moment to observe things. Yep, thank you.
I could go, I could go. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, so I haven't shared that today, but I've done a lot of um, higher education, like campus work. And some of the time also we've done um, with uh, child care, or we've done a place actually we uh, volunteered. It was, it was actually really rewarding. It was a, a safe house. It was for kids that come and almost a place for trauma happens. And so what I share with you almost here is kind of the more intensified work that allows us to advance the research and understand. And I think you're pointing out to almost another fold I think I want to explore is how we start disseminating this science into playgrounds, schools, even like just streetscape. Um, so the, the campus work actually I've been doing is helpful because you do, you end up touching the street, you end up uh, doing spaces that are open to all on all times. You don't have to go to a botanical garden. That project was a little bit like this, where it starts to become part of the larger fabric of the campus. But I think what I'm saying here is exactly right, is how do you take that and now disperse it even more into the public realm, right? Is that what I hear? With, with Yeah. Yeah, I, um, so where I teach at the University of Colorado Denver, Lois, you know, she, she has been doing programs where the goal was to enhance uh, playgrounds and so forth. And uh, we've had studios actually trying to explore that. I haven't had the chance to do an actual one, but I would love to because I do think that um, I'm mostly in Colorado. The, a lot of the playgrounds, they really suffer from a total lack of exposure to, actually one of them, we did one actually, it was for a school in Wichita. And the way we won the project, I asked the people in the room, I said, well, you know, think about it. Those are like young children that are from three to six they are spending the first three years of their life and they're only exposed to five textures. The painted metal, the concrete, the, the plastic mulch, the plastic, and the last one was maybe one blade of grass. Can you realize that? Like you're trying to educate and really broaden the perspective of the world for those children and you're only giving them like five textures. I was like, wow, that is really a sad story. So that from there, it's, I think it's fairly easy for all of you to start to imagine how we can do a lot better. Uh, so yeah. Oh, I have to turn off mine. Yeah, go. Yeah. Okay, I'll start with the last question. <laughs> so, 
So physical models, yes and yes, you need to because it is a multi-dimensional media. What you're working with is not flat, so we use sections and things, but we build physical models and we also build physical, uh, digital models. We actually, for the step garden, we, it was fun, we did this thing where we did a first model which was almost more about experience. And then we did a, a refined model, try to understand how to use stone in a very unique way without using any concrete so we're not um, putting any chemicals in the ground and so forth. And then we scanned it and we did a 3D models digital that then we can play with it and put a camera in it and really test the sense of scale. I wanted to make sure that in that garden you could feel like you don't have to push too high, you don't have to go too low, but it's gonna work to create. So I would say what's great today is that you don't have to choose, you should do both, and I don't think you should, I mean models are essential, they're all over the world in my studio, and a lot of architects that I work with, they do models. So great question. The other one is a great, even more deeper, more interesting question, and uh, the way, so for example in Denver, it's interesting, when you look at equity and, um, and how to take what we learn here. Like when you look at the city of Denver, they recently did a survey of tree canopies and realizing that all of the wealthy neighborhood had a lot of shade, all of the more uh, less well um, served neighborhoods were really lacking any sense of tree canopy. And so I think there's a great program, the Denver Botanical Garden, for example. We do those projects with them. It's a way of extending the research, finding the right species, and then they have this great program where um, it will allow uh, to create some interventions with uh, new trees and realizing that in tree medians we can remove a lot of pavement, so that's a study they are doing right now, and looking at can you go by mixing tree, young tree saplings with older trees, and by mixing it in Denver, it's a harsh environment and it's very hard to grow a good tree. So the more you maximize that sense of diversity like this, the more you can start to uh, account for the fact that you're gonna lose some trees over the years and you'll still have some trees later. Uh, so I think what I, what I see is that those gardens are almost like the uh, catalyst for change. And I think what's interesting is the more you can start to jump the wall of those gardens and start to infill the neighborhoods with those strategies and get very interesting. Like the, the seeding strategy for that dry meadow, it was not an expensive garden. It was just an experiment, but I think there's a lot to learn from it on how you could start to insert some of those ecologies into those. Um, less well um, cared for neighborhoods. At least it's one move, it's one thing, right? It's not necessarily you solve it all, but it's a, I think it's a start somewhere and hopefully it will trigger a sense of passion and, and interest in some of those communities for even caring for it and learning from it and those children to become the next towards, right? You. Yeah, you're welcome. Yeah, no, that's a great question. So, and that question is even more relevant in um, a place like Denver. So like right now, I'm doing a project with um, the university. It's interesting when you look at campuses today, like a lot of universities started on the East Coast. And when you look at Harvard Square, it's like mowed field, lawn, with trees in it equals university. And then some people, when they move to Denver, they try to duplicate the same thing, it's not working at all. So there's this initiative we're doing now on trying to research how to reinvent what it means to create a university and a campus. And where it goes with this is that, and what's what we learned also on uh, pollination, a lot of those are native plants actually of Pennsylvania. And some of the seeds, you can't even find them. You have to go in the wild to pr collect those seeds. That's what happened with the one in, uh, in um, Des Moines. We had to go, they had a group of people go to those uh, places in the fall, collect a lot of the seed heads, 
and try to propagate. And then Denver, for example, when we did the step garden, they are testing some of those plants, and then now you start to find those plants at the nursery. So I think the step one is there's a research. When we do those catalyst unique gardens, the goal is to make them as beautiful and inspiring as we can so people start to want to use more of the native plants, realizing they are beautiful and even more beautiful. I think like in Colorado, for example, a lot of the native plants, they have an ability to take on frost and snow in a way that is really beautiful. And so if you can kind of reveal that beauty to people, you can create a cultural change. And then the beauty of those native plants is that they are better suited to supporting native habitats because bees and, and pollinators, they kind of co-evolved with those plants. And so if you give them native plants, they will find the food that they need to sustain. If you import plants from elsewhere, they may have no relevance for some of those uh, species of pollinators. So it all ties together. So I think the, you have the research, you have kind of those revealing to people, and then what's interesting is to see the industry of landscape and nurseries and so forth starting to evolve and, and, f and allow people to buy those plants so that they can transform their own backyard in some ways. Does that answer your question? Yeah, okay. Hey. Yeah, so what I'm hearing, and I did both degrees, I did architecture and landscape, so I would say just work at getting, like this is a great school because you're all working together. I love how you have one floor and landscape architect and architect all together. I encourage you to go see when landscape architects are building models, go ask them questions. The more you understand each other, the more you stop thinking architecture versus landscape, the more you think, we are crafting a series of environments. I'm going from the curb to a space between uh, the curb and the front door. What's happening inside? I was inside going back to the outside. And so all of that is like a sequence. You're not, it's not like there's an object and an outside. The, the landscape is not just a green fluff between buildings. It's kind of in and out. And how can you bring landscape inside? How is light reflecting? How do you enjoy the season? How do you make the room feel like it's part of the outside and vice versa? How do you use natural light? I think all of those things, uh, when we work like with Lake Fredo architects, become part of the conversation. And when we draw spaces, I sometimes push the architects, I challenge their plans, and I say, how, how is this space feel like? So instead of thinking space as if it stopped at the glass, like just go beyond that. And then suddenly it triggers so much more imaginative ways of thinking of what is the floor made of inside, what is the floor made of outside, what, what is it that is outside that I can find back in the room. And then you start to think of scale and textures and I think that's where you can really enlighten and create some new spaces that you haven't seen yet. Yeah? Thank you. Yeah, thank you all. <laughs>